Welcome to another in our series of personal empowerment audio programs, Finding Yourself in Paradise. Hi, I'm Michael Benner. And I'm Steve Snyder, and uh, we certainly hope today's program makes sense. It's about senses. We talk about the five senses we all know and most people have heard of, whether they believe in or not, the sixth sense. But there are other senses beyond those basic ones that we'd like to discuss today. And again, we sure hope this makes sense. I'd like to begin, actually, with a little bit of NLP, Steve, because the senses are important to neuro-linguistic programming, but they're organized into three. The five senses get organized into three categories, and I think it's a good place to begin. Visual and auditory are the first two. So NLP uses the sense of vision and the awareness, the sense of being able to hear, as two of their three rep systems. And then all the others, I guess they cluster into what's called kinesthetic in NLP. That would be what? Touch and taste and smell? Yeah, and there are even others beyond those as well that we want to get into. But we start with the basic five that correspond to our physical senses. But remember, each one of those also has a corresponding imaginary sense, the mind's eye, the mind's ear. You can hear things without the actual ear being involved. So we have those senses of the nose and the eyes and the imagination of the nose and the eyes. But beyond that, that sixth sense is, is a pretty big, broad category. Some people call it intuition. Other people call it ESP, extrasensory perception, which would involve things like, you know, telekinesis and, and uh, precognition, things that may or may not actually exist. I mean, there's, you know, debate on both sides of those issues. But there are abilities that human beings have that can't be described through the senses that are certainly extrasensory. It's also very interesting, very important, I think, to underscore that in order for the sixth sense, so-called intuition, or as Steve said, sometimes it's called ESP, like it's an extra sense, extra sensory perception, or silver mind control, they used to call it affective sensory projection, which I thought was a nice twist. But we're talking about becoming aware of information at a distance, and you all know the five basic senses. We just went over them and the way they're used in neuro-linguistic programming. How does language, the words you're hearing Steve and I say right now, impact you, create a perception of reality, and then influence you? There's an art and a science around that that has many different names. So, now we're talking about the so-called sixth sense. And Steve, I suppose there could be an argument made that this is really not a sense at all. I would probably be on that side of the argument, actually. I don't think of it as being a sense, but because it's called the sixth sense, we bring it into the conversation today. But the, there are skills, talents, gifts, and abilities, I think, that all human beings have, and some have to a, a rarefied degree, you know, and, and they become what we call extrasensory or, or psychic or whatever word you want to use. I think we all have uh, intuition, clearly. I, I, one of the interesting things I discovered about intuition is that uh, women have a decided advantage when it comes to intuition is because they always have access to theirs, and we men lose access to ours when we get stressed because our corpus callosum connection between the two hemispheres is much smaller in men than in women. When we get stressed, our, our energy goes into fight or flight. It goes into go out and, and kill, you know, go out and get rid of those creatures that are, are threatening us. It's really fascinating because... In stress, in danger, the, the brain produces chemicals in men and women that are the same, these stress chemicals, stress hormones, but the way those chemicals act on testosterone is just the opposite of the way those chemicals act on estrogen. So when men get stressed, they go out to kill and protect, and when women get stressed, they come in, you know, in to protect their children, in and to get closer to each other. So it's a really a different way we deal with it. We all have access to intuition, but when men get stressed, they give up theirs. That's why in, in an argument where a man and a woman are having an argument, husband and her wife are having an argument and they're both stressed, he forgets what he said real quick and she remembers it forever. Yeah, it's uh, part of the Mars-Venus thing that Johnny Gray talked about very definitely. And it is a way we're different, but look at the phrase woman's intuition or women's intuition as if a man could not do that or could not have that. And of course we can. It's just that we need to shift a few gears, feel safe, relaxed, use those imaginary senses that you were talking about. The mind's eye is not just the ability to visualize, but also to imagine hearing and feeling. Imagine the, the, the fragrance on the gentle breezes blowing through your hair. I mean, that's all part of the mind's eye. 
and relaxing and using imaginary senses is the best way we know of to access intuition. Isn't that interesting? The sixth sense, to get it online, we really need to pull on these imaginary corollaries to the five physical senses. Yeah, and the five physical senses are pretty much based around the face and the head, except for touch. But this sense, this is more like from the gut or sometimes from the heart. So physical sensations in the body do give us information, and sometimes we tap into that and call it intuition. So that's kind of like a, a quick overview of the sixth sense. You know, there's so many different well, Let me talents. add one little oh, thing to sure. that. Intuition, when it arrives as an aha or an awareness... It arrives with a feeling of, that's it, with a liberating feeling of, oh boy, I found it, eureka, right? The aha insight. There is something called instinct that is sometimes described as a gut feeling, but is much lower in the body, and it's fear-based. Right. That's not what we're talking about. That's a survival thing. When that George Bush talked about, I rule from my gut, I don't think that's intuition, you know, I know, we'll waterboard them. I don't think that was this enlightenment, this, oh, what a great idea. I think it's fear-based. Oh, I think it's fear and shame-based. It's like, oh, they realized that uh, they'd gotten all these messages from the CIA that something bad's going to happen, and they ignored it, and they ignored it. And then when it happened, they're, they're deer in the headlights, and they just went into freak mode. And they said, we have to throw out the Constitution. We have to throw out everything because we have to go get all those bad guys. You know? And that's, not in, that's instinct. That's, that's survival of the species instinct. You know, It's like kill everything else that isn't you. So instinct is not intuition. Not even close. It's, it's great to have because when there is life-threatening danger, that's what you want. You want the instinct to fight or flight. But when it's dealing with human beings, fighting and running are really both bad ideas. It's a core fear response. You've heard Steve and I and probably other motivational speakers talk about the amygdala and the tendency to go into fight or flight, or there's actually four, fight, flight, freeze, or faint which I learned from you, Stephen, yeah. in the early 80s back at Live and Learn. It's actually fight or flight or freeze or faint. <laughs> so that's all a response to fear. And again, what we're saying is the sometimes called intuition or called the sixth sense or the gut feeling is lower than the gut. It's actually at the base of the spine. And you know the difference based on whether it arrives as an oh no or an oh boy. If it if it comes as a fear response, I know I'll use more fear because I'm afraid. So we'll fight terror with terror and we'll fight fear with fear and hate with hate. And well, that's not intuition, is it? That that's instinct. That's animal behavior, right? Run, fight, whatever. Intuition. I think it's valuable to point out. You feel it higher. You feel it in the tummy, in the upper tummy, tending toward the heart even, okay, as a location for the sensation. Plus, it arrives as light. It arrives as freedom. It arrives with a confirmation rush. Yeah, and even if it's about something bad, like even if you have an intuition that something bad's going to, it comes like, oh, good, I'm having a way to prevent it. Yeah, now I know what to do. Oh, yeah, yeah, oh, good, I've got a solution yeah. now for what. So intuition never is like a, a feeling of dread that something bad's going to happen. It's, it's like, oh, wow, I recognize the opportunity to do something good about this bad thing that might be occurring. So it's a different feeling, and, and it comes from the higher self, and the higher self's voice always feels safe. It, it, it never feels afraid because it knows there's nothing to be afraid of except true danger, and it knows that in true danger the autopilot kicks in, the instinct takes over. So the higher self, the voice of love, the voice of confidence and happiness, and the voice that feels safe doesn't have any of that fear in it. So that's that would be intuition. Intuition would be a love voice. Instinct is usually a fear-based voice. Yeah. So if somebody says to you, well, I just had a gut feeling... Ask him where in the gut. <laughs> High gut or low gut. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Was that an oh no or an oh boy? It's wonderful to begin to become sensitive to this and then to develop trust in your inner feeling. I, I got to confess, I spent so much of my life living above my shoulders with a belief that emotional feelings were just something else to be thinking about. I didn't know you could really feel them in the body. Because my body was so rigid, and, and I had a clear message from childhood that to be sensitive to my feelings was a weakness. So to learn to actually feel in my body, and then to trust that feeling, and to find out how remarkably sensitive it is, and that 
there is wisdom there. There is an emotional intelligence available to us. Just begin by discerning the difference between intuition and instinct. And yet I interrupted you. We were gonna, we've got a sense that there's a bunch of senses here. I, I think so. And actually that introduction you just gave about the sense of the difference between instinct being lower and intuition being higher in your body, that sort of leads into these other kinds of senses. I've been thinking about it a lot, actually. It's an interesting topic. I, I read a book called The Element by Ken Robinson, really good book. And uh, he mentioned the concept of there being more than the five senses. And so I started brainstorming and what would they be? Now, there's one that everybody considers a sense, but when you ask anybody how many senses are there, they always say five or six. You know, they, they never say more than that. But when I say, well, what about sense of balance? Oh, well, of course that's a sense. Everybody knows about the sense of balance. And then there's a sense of temperature, like is, do I feel warm, do I feel cold? That's a sense, uh, a sensa- uh, uh, an awareness of a sensation, that's a sense. There's the sense of motion or acceleration. You know, you feel like uh, you're moving or when the plane takes off, you can feel the sense of acceleration in your body. Uh, And you can also feel the kinesthetic awareness of like where your body is. Like, is is my arm up or down, you know? A a wonderful friend of mine, actually a cousin of my wife's, had brain surgery after brain cancer. And she's really recovered brilliantly. But for a while she was saying, I don't know where my hands are. I can't tell. She has to go look to see where her hands are because that part of her brain was, was damaged a bit in surgery. So so there's that awareness of where your body is in space. Like, like Michael Jordan, you know, could feel how his body was floating through space. And then there's a sense of time. Maybe even timing is the same or different. I'm not sure. And a sense of direction, like north, south, east, and west. So all these are different senses that sort of we feel in our bodies or become aware of in parts of our, our bodies or minds. So, so really beyond the five or six senses, there are at least a half a dozen more. And to be aware rather than leave all this on autopilot. I think that's the value of us talking about it. To be conscious of my awareness of how I'm oriented in space or my sense of time, how it can expand and contract, how time can dilate or it can shrink up. And we can even manage that then. We can make time go faster in our minds. Just get busy. And if you want time to slow down, then... uh, Wait for the water to boil. (laughs) Watch the pot never boils. So we can manage all of these things. Part of waking up, of becoming more aware, and what is personal empowerment? What is personal and spiritual development but awakening? And the word consciousness we use a lot, but there's also conscience and conscientious, and most of us don't even know how to spell these words. That's why I think words like hope, and audacity. I like the audacity of hope as a phrase, you know, because there is boldness in hoping, which is having a goal, having an awareness that this is possible, having a dream that I could do this, and then believing in that dream. That's part of waking up. And what we're talking about are ways to create that unfoldment of I'm more awake than I was yesterday and I have more possibilities. I have more choices. I'm less likely to see myself as a victim and I'm seeing the bigger picture too. And here's how by being conscious of all these different qualities of awareness. So let's start with the sense of balance because that's a sense most people understand as a sense. But let me Let me expand on the concept of a sense of balance in a physical and a psychological way. That is the sense of balance, grace, uh, dexterity, to be able to move fluidly through your environment is one sense of balance, to not tip over, you know. But the other sense of balance is to to put relationship and work in proper perspective, you know, to have the kind of balance in terms of your money and your health and your family, to have that kind of balance in your life where you're not overwhelmed by one thing and underwhelmed in another area. Appropriateness. Appropriateness. So there's that whole idea of balance, which is really staying in a state where I have the ability to move in any direction I need to when I need to. Like the great little martial arts experts, you know, they let you – push them in any direction, but they always keep their sense of balance. So at any moment, they could move in whatever direction they want to. That's a sense that some people have really, really developed. I mean, really paid a whole lot of attention to their physical sense, athletes and martial artists and the like. And then there are uh, other 
great, great leaders who have created a sense of balance in their lifestyle as well. But most people, I think, take the sense of balance for granted and don't work on developing it at all in any area of their life. They just, like, hope I don't fall over. <laughs> <laughs> or, or that I can run out of a stumble. Yeah. That's another thing. Somebody's graceful if they can run out of a stumble, right? Um, this is great. I remember you have brought to mind an old video. It must have been a kinescope from long before there even was videotape of a TV show that the great philosopher Alan Watts. Uh, the used, man who brought Zen to the American world. Yeah, in the 1950s, wrote a series of books. I'm sure most of our listeners know Alan Watts. Well, this was an old, like, educational television in San Francisco kind of a video. And he is talking about the concept of balance in Taoism and also in martial arts. And he said, now, we have to talk about center of gravity. Now, that was a term I've heard all my life, the center of gravity, you know, to stay balanced is to stay over your center of gravity. What does that mean? It means if there's a line that goes straight to the center of the earth, you've got to be above that line to be balanced because gravity's pulling you toward the center. He brings out a beach ball, Steve, and starts rolling the beach ball around on the floor while he's sitting there. And he says, notice, this ball is always over its center of gravity, right? And then he took a box, and he showed how a square box you could tip. You could tip and let it go, and it'd fall back where it was, or tip a little farther and let go, and it would tumble over onto the other side. That never happens with a ball. The ball is always straight over its center of gravity. And I thought, wow, what a mind-blowing concept. And then to take that to your physical body in the same way, stay stay balanced. And now you're saying, and in other areas of our life, look at the relativity of the choices we do make as conscious, sentient beings. Is this appropriate? Is this over the top? This thing you want, why do you want it? Who do you want it for? Maybe you're trying to please other people. Maybe you're trying to please unpleasable people. Are you sure you really made a choice? And that kind of balance in life, that's the place we have to start. We're fighting a lifestyle that causes us to be physically, our bodies to be physically out of balance. Because we sit so much in an unusual situation, like on a chair, or on a, and because we don't squat like we always used to, and because we don't run and stretch our muscles out, our, our spines are not aligned. I mean, the vast majority of people are out 10, 20% in terms of out of balance of their, their spine being straight up. If we climbed trees and ran and squatted like our ancestors did, our spines would be much more aligned. But because we sit and we slouch all day long, we've got that curvature of the spine that gets to be so common in, in most adults. So we're already out of balance. And to be balanced, we actually have to tip ourselves back to actually be balanced. So doing exercises like yoga exercises where you stand on one foot, you know, or, or, and put your arms out to the side, get a sense of how good are you at this? You know, how, it, and this is something, no matter where you are right now, you could get a little better at and a little better at. And the, the metaphor of getting better at standing on one foot or balancing, it, it's really more about becoming more aware of how, where you are in time and space, you know, where, where your body actually is. Let's use that as a segue, time and space. Our sense of time and our sense of where we are. In, yeah, like where's my arm? Is it up there or down there? Yeah, our sense of where our body is in space. Or even north, south, east, and west. Oh, Some sense of direction. Are, yeah. That's even another sense. Oh, that's even another that's one. That's even another one. Actually, right. there's a sense of body awareness, where our body is, and then a sense of where we are in our environment, north, south, east, west, upside down, right side up kind of thing. Lots so of, do you think these can be developed? Uh, and any one of them can, and all of them maybe not at once. You know, and the idea is you can do anything. You can be great at anything. You can't be great at everything. So you you want to choose which ones you want to work on. But yeah, let's say you want to develop your ability uh, to be more in touch with time and timing. Like the great comedians or the great lecturers, you know, they have this sense of timing. Like you wait that extra part. The great musicians, you wait that moment and then you add the note. That that's a sense of timing. And then there's Paul a, Harvey. Yeah. Remember the good day. Pause. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Pause. Perfect. And and then there's the idea that that knowing what time it is, like you know, is it you know, 
my wife is taking a class on uh, Hawaiian heritage, and, and traditionally Hawaiians don't wear watches. They just have these. There's there's this dawn time, and then there's this morningish time from like eight to eleven, and then there's this lunch, time, and they just have these sense of times. And, uh, and so, of course, appointments aren't at eight fifteen. You know, you know, like you know, see you at, in the morning time, but. But some people really are really good at knowing it's exactly 3.35 in the afternoon. Some people develop a great ability to do that as they cross time zones and, and don't, don't get jet lag and can adapt to different times. I've always been brilliant at that, actually. So there's this whole sense of time, timing, and where you are in time, you know? So you're talking about traveling, and I'm thinking about where did I get my sense of knowing – how I'm oriented to the poles. Like, I can always tell you where north is. And I really have a difficult time with Do that. You? That's the least of any of the senses or any of the intelligences that people have. My sense of direction is my worst by far. Teresa and I go into a hotel room, and we walk out, and we head in different directions. She knows where the elevator is. I don't. I have a great memory, but but I just don't know which way I turn. And I couldn't tell you north, south, east, and west for the life of me. That's probably one of the inherent reasons I moved here to Maui, because we don't need to know that. All we need to know is up mountain or down toward the ocean, uh, Mackay or Malka. Yeah, that's true. It's very clever. I I think it's backpacking. Ah, uh, yeah. And I always carried topographic maps. I never really relied on the trails, right? There's not much in the way of signage in the wilderness. The ethic is no signs, right? And animals make little trails, so you could get off the people trail made in the 30s by the CCC and start following an animal trail before you realize you're lost. So I always carried maps, but that wasn't enough. I wanted a sense of where I am, orienting myself, and I guess I would initially find landmarks. And then I just got trained to do that automatically so that I could drive cross-country. I always knew where I was. So, again... <laughs> To be aware of it is to choose to develop it, or not, I suppose. I mean, I wonder if we give something up to do that. Like I said, I don't think we can be great at everything. We can be great at anything. But if you, if, if you take as much time as it takes to develop one of these and try and put that much time into developing all of these, then there might not be enough time to do all that. So, so well, What I'm saying is, what if, do you think there's any chance that if you were to develop, let's say, your sense of direction to match your wife's? Would you lose something? Would you have to give something up? Is well, there some benefit of not knowing where you are? Oh, uh, that's an interesting question. I don't know about that. Uh, on a metaphysical level, there may be some truth to that. But what I was thinking is, if I were to decide to develop my sense of direction, the time and energy I put into doing that wouldn't be put into doing whatever else I would have done with it. Well, so I give that, that up. Yeah, if nothing that. else, I'd give that up. But but now, is there a secondary benefit? Is there an underlying payoff for having a bad sense of direction? I mean... You know, I've thought about that before. I, I don't know. There probably is some psychological benefit that people get from having uh, being bad at something and not developing it. Yeah, or maybe just freeing up neurons in the brain to do other things. Maybe, maybe. I think there's a lot more available than we're using. I mean, I don't think it's – We. I mean, it's not a matter of, like, we're going to run out of space up there. I, I, it's just time. You know, I time. mean, do, do, if, if we knew where we are in space, our sense of direction and our sense of time, are we giving up our access to some degree to a here and now sense of things that – Ultimately, where I am is where I am, and, and what time it is is always now, and that's certainly a reality, just to sit in the here and now. In fact, it may be a reality that trumps time and space, depends on your worldview of things. I don't know. I'm just asking if always being aware of what time it is or needing to know what time it is or or where north is or whatever would interfere with your sense of spontaneity. Yeah, or... you added a new equation there, needing to. I think that definitely would interfere. If there's a need to, then you slightly obsess on it, and then it takes away from your feeling safe and from your ability to perform uh, on autopilot at the, at the good things you want to do. Now, so definitely needing to know what time it is or know where you are, that, that definitely would take away from other things. But there are those who are gifted 
with the ability to just know what time it is. It doesn't really matter to them necessarily, but you say what time it is, oh, it's uh, 3.17, and they just know. Or there are people who, who could give you their exact GPS location. I mean, they could give you the latitude, longitude. They could tell you where the Earth is now in reference to all the other planets. They could tell you where this solar system is now in reference to the Milky Way. There are people who have an amazing ability to know exactly where they are in space. I mean, exactly like an astrologer who knows where the planets are. Well, that's the... a studied thing, I think, more likely. Although it might have been because they had that gift that they began to study it. But they're just people who have a sense of that, you know, and to expand to a great degree. And and do they give up other things? For example, a um, sense of, of hot and cold. I have a huge tolerance. I mean, it could be 100 degrees or 40 degrees, and I'm not uncomfortable. And there are people that are uncomfortable if it's over 72 and under 64. So that's a sense of, of hot and cold. What's hot? To some people, they feel hot when it's only 80, and I don't really feel hot until it's over 100. Some people feel cold when it's... 70, and I don't feel cold. Till, so, yeah, would I give up some of that maybe if I were to work on my sense of direction? That's an interesting question. I don't know. But I have a great sense of hot and cold or tolerance for hot and cold much more than most people do. So summarize for us. I know you're keeping track of these. Which one's beyond the five physical senses? And then the sixth sense, which, which is ESP about. or intuition. Right. And the difference between intuition and instinct. Right. And then we started talking about... Beyond that, we've talked about the sense of balance both in your physical body and in your life, the sense of direction, north, south, east, and west, the sense of kinesthetic awareness where your body is in space, and sense of time. And then we just also talked about sense of temperature, hot and cold. And really the only one left that I've thought of is the sense of, I guess you call it motion or acceleration. Am, am, I, sta- am I stable or am I moving? You know, the sense that I'm moving or I'm moving fast, that, that feeling of, of motion. Wouldn't a lot of these fall into the general area of kinesthesia? Not in an NLP way, but doesn't the empirical science establishment have a physiology people have a term of kinesthesia for all of that stuff, motion and time and I don't, hot and cold? I don't and, think all of those fall – time I don't think falls into that category. I don't think all of those do. Some might. Certainly yeah, the, the body awareness is called kinesthesia, uh, understanding the nature of how the body moves. But, but in terms of nor- direct sense of direction, I don't know if that's kinesthesia. Like we were talking about that DUI test where uh-huh. the police make you close your eyes and sometimes stand on one foot. And with your eyes closed, you have to put your fingertip on the end of your nose. Well, how do you find your nose? When you're sober, <laughs> I mean, right? I mean, when you when you're drunk, then that skill goes away. That's why they test it. But but even when you're totally sober, some people aren't very good at that, and other people could just unerringly do it over and over and over again. How do you do that? I doubt that very many people in the world could answer the question, "How do you do that?" I mean, how do you know that you're on target or not? You know? But it can be trained, I'm sure. Just like people, athletes can be trained now for peripheral vision. I mean, we all come in at varying degrees of Adeptness, is that the way to say it? At peripheral vision, we all have peripheral vision, but some people see better peripherally than others. But what we now know is you can train people. You you can, but those that were born with a gift have a huge advantage because you can train them too. So, you know, if you don't have a talent, a gift, or natural ability, you really can't become world-class at anything. But you can become the best you can be at anything. Although, as I said, not the best you can be at everything. So the feeling in your body when a vehicle accelerates or like... uh, I fell in an elevator once. I mm. was in an elevator in college that broke. And mm. We, mm. we dropped two stories and hit these big springs at the bottom. Went boing, boing, boing. The feeling of that elevator dropping. Uh, it's or like, a, a roller coaster is probably the closest most people yeah, have yeah, ever experienced. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. It's like your whole body drops except your stomach. Yeah. <laughs> yeah <laughs> that that stays like. here. That's what it feels like, yeah. <laughs> you fell away from your stomach, but that's okay. It'll catch up with you in a minute. Uh, All the way through the throat. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Mm. So is that what you're talking about? That that's yeah. The sense of emotion and acceleration. Sense like, am I spinning clockwise? Am I spinning counterclockwise? How am I moving? You know, I mean, is this feel fast? Does this feel slow? For some people, uh, can I jump? With uh, grace and dexterity, I mean, that sense of motion, like my body is moving and I'm aware of... Some people, it's like out of their control almost. It's like autopilot. Their body just moves. You know, they just walk and they and they stumble and fall. Uh, or sometimes, if they have a natural ability, they stumble and then autopilot like takes over and they do that graceful... You know, I do that. I trip frequently, but I usually... Catch myself. Run out right? of it. Yeah. yeah, run out of it. Catch myself. Uh, I, I do clumsy things, but like I, like I'll knock a glass of water off the table, but I'll catch it before it hits the ground. You know, what I mean, it's pretty remarkable sometimes the way we, when I. 
all of a sudden get mindful, and in, in that instant, just it just my body does the right thing. Right. And and that can be trained also. Yep. But as you say, if you're born with the knack, yeah. then you can be trained too, so you're just starting at a higher yep. level. The knack. That's a nice name. The knack. You know, like a, as a gift, uh, as a you know natural ability, the knack. I worked at a radio station called The Knack, ah. KNAC, many, many, many years ago. This guy, Ken Robinson, wrote the book The Element. He said that's, that he calls it like the element is where your passion meets your talent, you know, where you find your thing, your calling. Oh, your, nice. Yeah, The Knack, the, the Element. You're in your element. That's a nice way of putting it. Great book. Well, I think uh, as we go to do the audio journey, there's a couple others we got to mention. We we talked about it briefly here, and that's common sense, and is that a sense? Yeah, common sense isn't really a sense. I mean, it's. I think common sense is kind of street smarts. You know, common sense is like, uh, real common sense is like knowing the logical right thing to do under those circumstances from wisdom, from observing other people's mistakes and not having to make them all yourself. Common sense isn't quite very common, really. I mean, it's a pretty uncommon thing. Um, I think that's true. And then, of course, nonsense. Nonsense is uh, one of my favorite senses of all. Uh, my wife was saying, well, like, she, we were driving over this morning, and she said, like the sense that you could be a great basketball player or I could be a great ballerina. And I said, yeah, that's nonsense. That's the kind of sense that is. So nonsense is, is the absurd. It's the, but, but, but the other side of that, is there a sense of logic? I mean, is there a sense of this is logical, this is right? Is that a sense, you know, uh, that something is the opposite of nonsense but quite – Smart sense, you know, all these senses, whether they're really senses or not, they're all talents, gifts, and abilities that we can develop. And and uh, you know, pick your poison, pick which ones are real interesting to you, and and work on them because you can work on them both in the real world and also, of course, in the land of Alpha in your mind, which we're about to do with our audio journey. In fact, as we transition into the audio journey, I think it's real important for us to mention that. Philosophers, East, Middle East, and West have pointed out throughout the ages from time out of mind that while many people believe what we're talking about, developing these senses or a sense of yourself, helps you to better understand reality, there have always been those who've said, at least about the physical senses, that they are a distraction from reality. And so I would have you ponder that as we do our Alpha journey, our audio journey, as we go to paradise to find ourselves through sense and sensation, the physical senses give you information about the physical world. But there are other senses, non-physical senses. And that's what we're going to pull upon now as we ask you to breathe and relax and use sensory imagination to go to a place a perfect peace. So if, as long as this is a good time for you, put down that notepad and pencil because I know you were taking notes. Do you have a sense of it being a good time for uh, you? I, it's a good time for it's me. It's a good time for me too. <laughs> so uh, otherwise pause us and you can come back when it's a better time. But here we go. Get a, nice and comfortable. Again, you want to sit straight up. But not rigidly so. In fact, you want to be balanced and centered over your center of gravity. Balanced as you create and sense a feeling of safety, a feeling of deep relaxation. <sighs> and your body releases all the tension. And your emotions let go of all the stress. And your mind is free of the confusion. And you feel peaceful. And you feel blessed. And you feel balanced. Extremely balanced. In this place of perfect peace. Imagine that you walk and stand with gracefulness, move any way with ease, feeling graceful and agile and dexterous, feeling like your body is in your command as you walk gracefully, gently through this very peaceful land. And consider that 
there can be elements of grace and elegance in the way you think and feel. Moreover, in the way you perceive your thoughts and your feelings. You can think of sense and sensation, as we've described it today, as ways of getting information about where you are and what you need to do. I'd have you consider that in addition to that, what we're talking about are qualities of awareness that speak directly to your very identity, to the who you are and why you do what you do. What is important to you? What are your values? Now you have all these senses to pull upon, and you give each its due measure of credibility. You weigh this sense or that sensation, this awareness, that intuitive realization against this or that or the other. You're not limited, fortunately, to the reasoning that is in fact little more than deductive logic. General to specific, take it apart, break it down, slice it and dice it. And if that doesn't give you an answer, well, that's as far as most people go, but you have more. You have intuition, and you have an awareness that you are even more than your thoughts and your feelings. That's the awareness of time, of space, of direction, of movement and motion, of temperature, and, and these various senses that we've been talking about. Consider now, effortlessly, what your senses and the priorities and weights that you give them reveal about your unique identity, about the self that we discover and develop in paradise. And if you knew that what you could do is improve in any area you choose, which area, which sense would you better like to use? Would it be the sense of balance, the sense of temperature, a sense of motion and speed, a sense of time or space or direction? What do you need? What would help you? What would benefit you? What would make life better than it's been? Pick one or two of these senses. That's the place that you can begin. And just use your imagination, the power of the senses in your mind, and pick one of these areas, whichever one you find most intriguing, and then begin believing that you can be better as you imagine that you are. Visualize, conceptualize, theorize, practice wise, and become better, better than you are. Yeah, trust yourself. See, you're so much smarter than you think. You see, that's a play on words. You are smarter than you think. You're smarter. Your mental capacity is greater than you know. But beyond thinking, you're smart in emotional intelligence and these other senses, intuition, even instinct when appropriate. To react in a dangerous situation on autopilot can be a good thing. That reflex, just don't want to make all your important management decisions on a reflex and instinct. This is who you are. This is why you do what you do. Wake up. Want to know more. Because the good news is the more you understand through expanded awareness of who you really are, the more you're going to like who you are. And there's no danger of getting a big ego because part of expanding your awareness is to know that, while necessary, the ego doesn't have to run the show. It can ride shotgun or we'll put him in the back seat and let this more harmonious, more caring, more loving and compassionate higher self be in charge. 
if you'll but let go and begin to develop trust in what you know of yourself first and then other people. There's not much to learn about yourself from looking at other people. You're incomparable, so are they. No point in comparing. Know yourself directly with the study and the reflection that we're providing here. Other teachers in the same way, showing you that self-knowledge allows you to find the master within you, the essence of you. And again, the more you know of who you are, the more you're going to like who you are. I guarantee it. And you will find the parts of yourself that you will learn to like the most in the places you've been most afraid to look. Face yourself with courage. You can master every fear. And once you do, what you'll find in you is that your talents become crystal clear. So if there's a reason that you hesitate to get better or to improve, if there's something that seems to be stopping you from getting out of the rut and into the groove, well then take a look at the fear. It'll become very clear. And when you get that fear to release, when you replace that sense of I'm not safe with a sense of inner peace, then you can move forward. Then you can do what you need. Then you'll find your intuition will be happy to take the lead. So just say to yourself, I am a sensitive being. I am a sensible being. I am a finely calibrated, well-tuned, sensitive instrument. What a piece of work is man and woman. And every day in every way, I know a little bit more about the senses beyond physical sense and sensation. Does it show you reality? Or does it distract you from reality? You're going to have to deal with the physical world around you, whatever belief system you end up adopting, whatever philosophy it is at the end of the day that you wrap around yourself, clothe yourself in, invest in. But be aware of awareness. Be awake enough to see yourself becoming ever more clear, more lucid, more awake. And prepare yourself now to come to the waking state. Wide awake, focused out through your physical senses into the physical world of form. Take a slow breath, fill your lungs, and now open your eyes wide awake, alert, rested, refreshed, back in the room, more sensitive than ever. And notice that you can sense this is different than what you were experiencing just a little while ago. You have a sense of what state of awareness you're in, that you're, you've moved from narrow awake to this more wide awake kind of state. More going on out here. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> lots of stuff. So the sense of awareness is yet another sense. And, and one, one I'd like to finish with, I think, uh, given that it's sort of exciting to think about getting better in all these areas of life, but I don't think you can get better at everything at the same time. How about a sense of appropriateness? That's a, a real important place to, to begin to do whatever it is you want to look at your, in your life. You don't want to go so gung-ho at one thing that you don't do the other things that need to be done. There's a sense of appropriateness, and I think honing that, fine-tuning that sense is a good place to begin in terms of choosing what other senses you want to enhance. Integration. To be integrated, well integrated, to be well integrated is to be whole. So appropriateness, balance. Yeah. Reminds, well, us, reminds me of one of the very first seminars you and I ever did was integrated living, remember? That's right. and, and we would have an integrity. That, that, that root is very powerful in our history. Integer, for sure. integral. Yeah. yeah. Inter. Hey, we're all out of time, but we sure appreciate you checking out the program. Be sure and tell your friends. Use that share one. Send one to a friend gadget right there on the member page at FocusedPassion.com. And remember the Family Learning Hour. Send that out to everybody you yeah, know. Yeah, again and again is all I was going to add. Uh, it doesn't cost you a thing. 
the more you send, the better, and all for the three ninety six per month that you're contributing to Focused Passion and to our efforts to help you change the world by changing who you are. Be the change that you wish to see in the world. Become the person that you would like other people to be, and you'll enhance your ability to influence other people. It's not risky at all. It's very liberating. Responsibility is not the burden it might seem at first blush. It's actually quite a wonderful freedom to be responsible, to be able to make choices, to contribute life-affirming, positive, empowering programs to other people with a single click. Sounds like a good idea. So pass it on. Pay it forward. And life's a relay race, so. Thanks for being with us. As always, be gentle, love life, and take care of each other. For Steve Snyder, this is Michael Benner. Aloha from Maui.